Um, as Dr. Issa said, I will be talking about tailoring treatment for gender and sexually diverse Latinx youth with suicidal behaviors. And I'm using the word Latinx to be inclusive of all genders, such as female, male, trans, gender fluid, non-binary, for example, among others. Next. I, have, I do not have any conflict of interest, and you can see uh, the funding that I have received to do this work. Next. <clears throat> the objectives of this presentation are to explain, um, basically, well, to introduce the social cognitive behavioral therapy for suicidal behaviors, explain its main theoretical components, and to share some ideas about how to tailor treatment for gender and sexually diverse Latinx youth. And to do that, I will introduce some data first about the prevalence of suicidal behaviors. Next. The first step in understanding how to provide a social cognitive behavioral therapy for suicidal behaviors, which is a culturally centered approach, is as a clinician to recognize and acknowledge my own identity. This means to understand who I am in terms of education, race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, preferred language, and personal values and culture, among a lot more. <clears throat> this is to comprehend my potential bias and how different or similar my experience may be from the experiences of those I'm working with. In other words, um, I must understand those aspects of my identity that make me part of a minoritized group, as well as those aspects that give me some privilege. And some aspect of my identity that relates to the development of this protocol is that I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, which is an unincorporated territory of the United States located in the Caribbean. Puerto Ricans are natural born citizens of the United States. Spanish is our primary language, and even though English is taught as a second language, about an 80% of the population self-report that they did not speak English very well. Next. Latinx in the U.S. are 50 million total and include a diverse population coming from different countries. Besides those 50 millions, there are 3.5 American citizens living in Puerto Rico. Next. We are diverse, but at the same time, there are key common characteristics that from my perspective, justify the development of a therapy framework for Latinx, Latinx youth that could then be adjust to individual differences. And you have there are some of those differences and commonalities. One of those is the language, Spanish, um, physical features, mix of races, the values of familismo, spirituality, personalismo, um, some common values and beliefs rooted in a history of conquest and colonization, the experience of migration, acculturation, process, stress, and discrimination, among, among many others. Next. Over the years, Latinx adolescents in the U.S. have been reporting a higher prevalence of suicide attempts in comparison to their Black American and White American peers, with the exception of the most recent Youth Risk Behavior Survey in 2017. Um, this is a representative national survey of, survey of high school students done by the CDC. Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico, uh, the green line in the top, have consistently report higher prevalence than Latinx in the U.S. And the red one are Latinx in U.S. Latinx have also reported higher prevalence of suicidal ideation compared to their blacks and white peers. Next. Latinx females think about suicide and attempt suicide two times more often than males, according to this national survey. And females, as you see, are the, the blue column. Suicide ideation is um, if you have considered seriously attempt suicide during the past year and attempt, if they have attempt 
suicide during the past year. Next. In terms of suicide rates, which means numbers of deaths per 100,000 people in that specific group, the highest is among non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Native, la, line number five, followed by non-Hispanic whites, line number four. Um, also, it's very important to acknowledge that even though Latinx female, female youth think about suicide, attempt suicide more often than males, Latinx male youth dies by suicide four times more often than females. Next. In terms of sexual orientation, Latinx that identify themselves as gay, lesbian, or bisexual attempt suicide significantly more than their heterosexual peers. As you can see, the blue column are females and yellow are males. Uh, females that identify themselves as lesbian or bisexual attempt suicide three times more than their heterosexual peers. Males that identify themselves as gay or bisexual attempt suicide five times more than their heterosexual peers. And this is among the Latinx students in US. Unfortunately, this national survey does not provide information regarding trans or gender fluid youth, but the limit research in the area point out to higher prevalence of suicide ideation and attempts among trans teens in comparison to their cisgender peers. Next. Currently, there is no evidence-based treatment for Latinx youth with suicidal behavior, so most people got that correct. And what evidence-based treatment means is having a treatment that has been found to be superior than treatment as usual using a randomized clinical trial design. Next. Data on evidence-based practices, which is different from evidence-based treatments for suicidal Latinx youth is limited, but slowly growing. And what informs evidence-based practices is any type of study with any research design, such as case studies or semi-experimental designs. Um, we have also some proof that taking into account culture and specific factors for specific cultural groups is important based on several meta-analysis done with this other, other disorders and other treatment. Next. There are unique aspects in the experiences of Latinx youth and their families that are relevant to understanding and targeting their suicidal behaviors. Latinx values could be embraced differently by teens and caregivers due to differences in acculturation and enculturation between them, which creates tensions and family conflicts, usually around topics related to the teens' growing need for autonomy and identity. And for those that don't know these terms, acculturation refers to the process of adopting the values, customs, and behaviors of the host culture, in this case, US American culture, while enculturation refers to keeping and protecting one's own cultural values and custom, in this case, the Latinx culture or uh, Dominican culture or Venezuelan, depending on the background of that, that specific family. In US, language can be a barrier as well for treatment and a barrier in communication between teens and caregivers. When caregivers speak little or no English, and teens speak little Spanish, making more complicated family interactions. And all these factors in some ways affect identity integration, because as it says there, a cultural conflicts emerge in which is, there's a conflict between parents and teens when they are talking about our ways in my country, in my times versus the American way, which is the, the one that most teens adopt because they are exposed more to the school system, peers, and culture um, as the American way, in quotes. Um, next. Um, 
given that this is an intermediate level seminar, I will assume that most of the audience have seen this model before and have the clinical training to do cognitive behavior therapy or CBT, um, known by its, by its letters. CBT is the basis for this new treatment approach. Um, next. In 2010, during the initial phase of treatment development, there was a CBT culturally adapted protocol for Latinx youth in Puerto Rico with efficacy in reducing depression, um, which was the base for this treatment. And you can see the tree reference in green to the right. There was also an integrated CBT protocol developed for youth in the US, the orange box, with suicidal behaviors and comorbid conditions with a predominantly white English speaking sample that had positive outcomes on reducing suicide attempt. So neither of these two protocols were established evidence-based treatment for the target population and the target outcome of Latinx youth with suicidal behaviors, but together they were the closest. Then the third aspect in this mix was including those distinctive factors that I talk about based on empirical studies and theoretical considerations. Those, and those are particular for the Latinx community. Um, I also encourage you to read the paper that I'm citing there uh, to get more information about the treatment development process. Next. Based on this mix, new perspectives were added to the CBT approach and a specific change were done to the CBT manual. An ecological approach was added as well as a developmental approach centered on identity, a feminist and gender perspective, including an LGBTQ affirmative approach, known as well as gay affirmative, and a family system per perspective. And I want to explain what an LGBTQ affirmative approach means. Uh, this is a therapeutic approach based on the belief that LGBTQ ex plus expressions are natural variations of humanity, seeking to normalize, validate, destigmatize, and support sexual and gender diversity. Next. The change model for the social cognitive behavioral therapy includes the regular mechanisms of change of the CBT, plus the aspects of identity integration, which has to do with the healthy identity development and the aspects of family interactions and communication. Next. Um, this model is based on a CBT, as I already explained, but is embedded with an ecological framework, framework which was one of those additions. Um, this is important to comprehend the interaction among personal, interpersonal, and sociocultural factors, as well as risk and protective factors in each level. And in order to understand why suicidal ideation and behaviors are higher among teens with diverse sexual orientation and gender identities, we need to look into the world that we live in, their social norms, ideas, and values. Many of those social norms, such as patriarchy, religiosity, and machismo uh, that support an heteronormative values could be embraced with more intensity by the Latinx community. And I want to explain briefly what heteronormative means. That's the value or the idea um, is based on the attitude that heterosexuality is the only normal and natural expression of sexuality. And this also implies the classification of gender into two distinct opposite forms um, of masculine versus feminine. So that's heteronormative. That's how we grow up. That's the ideas that we have since we are watching TV uh, or seeing the novelas. Um, and those are the models that are reinforced out there. So it makes harder for some um, communities to self-affirm themselves in terms of gender and sexual orientation. I wanna please go to the next, um, the next slide. Um, 
So those social bias produce an external and internal effect. And that could be greater as teens may experience multiple minority stress, depending on how many aspects of their identity are part of a minoritized group. The understanding of how certain social values and norms produce such a negative impact informs discrimination and aggression, and how we all have been socialized in a way that we have internalized some bias to some extent is very important. First, to be aware of our own biases and work with them. And as clinicians, this is extremely important. And two, to understand the impact of internalized racism, homophobia, biphobia, or transphobia, depending on the case. Next. Going back to identity, for many teens, a smooth self-identity development can happen when there is a nice integration between the teen's individual characteristics and the family, community, and religious spiritual values that surround them. But, next please. But for others, this, this could become particularly problematic when there is a dissonance between any of those aspects of the self. Some examples could be caregivers expecting of sexual purity versus teens sexual exploration, or a teen with a growing LGBTQ plus identity versus Latinx values or expectations of having a traditional family. Um, the reference you could see there is an example of a case study in which a gay Puerto Rican teen was having conflicted identities between his spiritual, family, and sexual uh, identities and how therapy helped him um, in integrating those three aspects of his identity in a healthy way. So I encourage you to read that paper as well. Um, in summary, family tension conflicts around the identity crisis of adolescent phase amplify by differences in acculturation and culturation between caregivers and teens in combination with other social factors and the teens deficiencies in coping and possibly underlying mental health conditions could lead to suicidal behaviors in Latinx. And I see that we already have the next slide. And in that slide, um, uh, I wanna show the treatment protocol. The treatment protocol consists of basically two phases. Phase one is the crisis model, which is the same for everything we have, everyone, and the focus on the stabilization of the crisis. And phase two consists of interchangeable coping models that depend on the adolescent's major needs. Um, and I have to say this protocol was built for teens with suicidal behaviors. That's the target outcome here, just to clarify. Usually they come uh, from the inpatient unit after having a suicide attempt or having suicide ideation um, so high that they needed more intense treatment. And then after that inpatient or partial hospitalization, then they receive uh, this protocol. And then after, after all the, the teens get the crisis model to stabilize their crisis, then the team with some feedback from the clinician, um, they are the one who decide which is the next model they want to do in order to encourage engagement and autonomy in their own treatment process. So each of those squares that you see, thought model, affect regulation model, family communication model, all of those are different topics. And usually each model takes, could take like uh, a month or so, depending on how frequent are the sessions with the teen and the family. Next. Um, so here are the sessions included in the crisis model, and I will um, just be able to get to the first three sessions, basically, that represent uh, three very important components of this treatment. The first session is a family session in which the story of the suicidal crisis is explored 
from each family member perspective. At the same time, the theoretical model is introduced and the different events in the family story are placed in the context of the levels in the ecological model. And you can hear in that session the perspective of each and the concern that they have. Because everyone is there, you can hear what is public knowledge and what is not. And then on the individual sessions that you have with the teen and the parent, then you can get more information of those things that they may not want to share in, in the forum of the family. The first individual session is um, an identity, identity session, and I will discuss that one uh, very soon. The first session with caregivers alone is fo focused on engaging them by understanding their own background and how it is for them raising their kids in a different culture or in a different time compared to when they were raised, as well as listening to any additional concern, as I said, that, may that they may have about their teens. This is a session for listening, empathize without or to do any intervention, but understanding where where they are and what is the worldview that they have. Next. Next, please. Yes, so these are the objectives of the first individual session with the adolescent. One of the main ones is to identify areas of the adolescent identity that may influence suicidality. Next. Um, and before going into details of, uh, uh, to that session, I want to review with, with you the gender unicorn for those that didn't listen to the previous seminar, which actually was a great seminar. Um, gender identity is how you see and identify yourself in terms of gender. Gender expression is how you show yourself to the world in terms of your manners, dress, behaviors, and so on. Sex, sex assigned at birth has to do with your genes and genitals. Uh, these three do not have to match between each other. And this is very important to understand. So you can actually have an identity session where, where you can see that teens could fall in different places uh, about how they see themselves. Physical and emotional attraction have to do with sexual orientation and they could match, but they do not have to match either. Having these difference, differences clear, we're ready to explore identity with our teens. Let's go to the next session. Um, as I said before, the first individual session with the teen is the, uh, the identity session in which the main topic and way of engaging is exploring the differences, dimensions of their identity including questions around personality, reasons for living, sexuality, gender, gender expression, race, ethnicity, likes, preferred language, spirituality, and exploring any discrimination and possible conflicts between any aspect of their identity or with caregivers. We frame this session within, within the adolescent phase of discovering more about yourself and affirming who you are. We use a worksheet to generate this discussion as the one that you're seeing here. When you explore personality traits, you want to see if there are characteristics such as impulsivity or aggressiveness that influence the suicide attempt um, or suicidal crisis, as well as how is their self-esteem if they could endorse, for example, positive characteristics. You assess reasons for living to keep the team connected with life and to actually see what is important for them. This is our first page. Next, next slide, please. We open the topic of sexuality by asking these questions. And depending on their answers, we could follow up with more questions. Um, we ask about what does sexual, sexuality means to you? What's your sexual orientation? Are you comfortable with your Are you comfortable with your sexuality? What do you like about the people you are attracted to, and so on? 
to open this discussion. And remember, this is done with every team. Um, we ask also about gender identity by asking, what's your gender? Gender expression by asking, where do you fall in, in your gender expression? And they have to make a mark and see, um, for example, that this is present as a continuum. And what are your pronouns? Um, so we try to do this in a fun way, but also it's a ways of exploring, open up, and giving the, the, the information to the team that we are okay about discussing openly about uh, any of these topics. Um, next, please. This is um, the second page of our worksheet in which we explore likes, language, spiritual and political views and beliefs, and if those beliefs are similar or different from their parents. Um, and I want to point out here, remember that in terms of what acculturation and enculturation means, is that usually uh, caregivers and teens have different perspective in many ways of different things, and that could be religion, political views, uh, likes, um, sexuality, gender. So we want to understand where they are and and where are their parents in, in relation to all of these topics. Um, if the teen have any particular issues related to religion, differences in religion, that will come up. If there's any differences about sexuality, how they see sexuality, that will come up and so on. Next, uh, next slide, please. We explore their race and ethnic identity and how they feel about it. And at the end of all this discussion about identity, then the key questions are, are your parents supportive or are they concerned about any aspect of yourself? Likes, belief, sexuality, gender expression. And if so, why do you think is that? Um, we also ask if they have felt discriminated due to any aspect of themselves. Um, it is very important not to assume anything. Having an LGBTQ plus teen does not mean that their suicidality is connected to their sexual orientation or gender identity. It may be something else. We cannot assume either that every caregiver will be rejected. They may be supportive. And issues have to do with victimization at school or something else. So that's why it's so important just to open up discussions about all this topic and what is their parents' perspective about this, about basically their identity, their growing identity. This session set the base for the rest of the therapy in many ways. Is there any, if there's any issue regarding sexuality, as I said, or gender that will come up, an additional task for us is that well to recognize in which phase the teen is in terms of their identity integration. There may not be a need to further explore sexual orientation or gender. Or if the teen is questioning or uncertain about any of this aspect, we may need to go further. But we cannot assume either or the other. Next, please. Some further questions may look like this. Um, who are you attracted to in terms of physical attraction, sexual attraction? And with whom do you have a special emotional connection? How comfortable do you feel with your sexual orientation? And I want you to see that we have the response in a continuum. Um, and we also need to be aware that satisfaction has to do with how much support versus rejection from others they feel, any conflicted values, any internalized homophobia. So um, this is, we're just here like understanding where they are to be able to work. Next, please. Another set of questions could be the, the about gender, about your gender, with whom you identify the most, 
which that question is related to gender identity. How about your gender expression? That's about gender expression. How do you like to present yourself the most? How comfortable do you feel with your gender identity and expression? Um, which correspond as well a little bit with the uh, worksheet that, that you just saw. Well, we can get deep in this as, as we need it. Next, please. So the LGBTQ identity development process has been described as one beginning as an internal process of coming out, coming in, I'm sorry, to self, to an external process of coming out to others. Usually when coming out to others, the person may start with a close supportive friend to a family member that they perceive may be more supportive. And the last one usually are parents. Um, has also been described as a non-linear process, which means that a person may go back and forth between different phases. And of course, we need to know if we have a team that is questioning or identify themselves as LGBTQ+, plus, we need to understand in which phase they are. The identity confusion phase uh, is where when the teens begin to realize that they are attracted to people of their own sex. Identity comparison is usually when the teens begin to recognize differences between other people and themselves. Identity tolerance, when their self-perception as part of the queer community increase, and they begin to look for similar peer groups. Acceptance is associated with more contact with people of their own sexual orientation and dealing with negative thoughts and prejudice about themselves and their sexual orientation toward gaining a better, a better attitude toward their sexual orientation and their closet. Um, identity pride, uh, is related to a more positive view toward their sexual orientation, feel more comfortable about their sexuality and coming out to others. And synthesis is related to feeling very comfortable and usually being out of the closet in most places. The type of support in therapy will depend on where the teen is in this continuum. For example, if a teen is ready to come up to others, will be more beneficial to help them problem solve around how to do it, pros and cons, and how to stay safe in this process. If they are in the process of coming in to self, surely there will be more cognitive work to do around that. But of course, you will use both strategies problem solving and cognitive restructuring constantly, but understanding the whole ecological model and all the influences that this teen and ourselves are having just for being part of the society that we're in. Next. So I wanna give you um, some examples of how to work individually with the teen in terms of cognitive restructuring, which is a basic skill in CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so how to work with negative thoughts? Um, first, and again, we need to acknowledge the impact of internalized homophobia in producing negative thoughts about themselves. We also need to distinguish between realistic thoughts versus real cognitive dis distortions. For example, Situation one, if my dad knows this, he will kill me. Um, so the first things we need to do is assess for safety. Never push a teen to come out. It's their process. Help them assess risk and benefits for them. And if they are convinced that they want to come out in a hostile, hostile family environment, there has to be a plan in place for safety. So is this a negative thought or a realistic thought? That may not kill them, but keep them out of the house or beat them up. Or you have already assessed where their parents are and they know already that they, there's, there's something going on around sexuality or gender and they are ready to listen from their teen 
but it's more the teen's fears, fear of rejection. So we need to be very aware of both sides. The teen internal process, the caregiver's process, and what is going on in the context to see if they're being, they're being re uh, rejected or discriminated or there's any bullying or any other thing going on. Um, so that's one situation we have to, to think about. Is this realistic or is this a real cognitive distortion? Number Another situation, I will never be able to have my own family. That may be a negative thought that someone from the LGBT plus community express. You have as a clinician to work with the core belief sustaining that idea. The negative thought is coming from the idea that there is one type of family. So we have to go back to the step on the cognitive restructuring process. Number one, where is this idea coming from? Social norms, church, movies, family, beliefs and ideas. We need to then distinguish between belief and ideas some people have versus fact. So we can, um, help the team being clear that some people have the idea that families are mom, dad, a few kids, and a dog or a cat. Some people have that idea, but not all. And there are facts that there are a lot of different type of families. Number two, we have to um, explain that is normal to have certain ideas because we were taught that. There is a socialization problem. There is an, an internalized homophobia. So we have to explain them what is this of internalized homophobia and that socialization so they can know from where those ideas are coming from. And we have to ask, if the, is this true? That let's look for the evidence. Social norms may not be right or true. How do you prove or know that, is, that that is true or not true, right? And then we have to go for evidence-based information around any uh, type of idea that they may have. And step number four, you have to challenge them by look, ask them to look for positive models. In this case, for example, let's look for queer family models and how they look like, how they are. There's a lot out there. Um, and that could be very positive, so they can have role models. That's, for example, on that situation too. And I want to go to situation three. Let's say someone say, uh, one team that you're seeing say, if I become lesbian, I will end up in hell. In this case, this, this may come from, from two set of values that are conflicted. Um, and we have to go with the same process. Where is this idea coming from? Some churches believe that, but there are other churches that are LGBTQ plus affirmative. And you may want to look for that. You may want to look for what they say about being part of the queer community, because there are alternative ways, even in the uh, religious uh, places, different views so we have to help them see what is the difference about different views versus facts and evidence um next please so i want to provide as well some ideas about how to work with the family with the team i will summarize we need to see where they are in their identity development process we need to see if there, if there is internalized homophobia or not, or if more external rejection, discrimination. And we have to help them navigate their internal world and the external world, support them in terms of what they want, if they are, if they are already, if they came into themselves, if they already are clear that they are gay or lesbian or bisexual or queer, if they're clear on that, the direction will be maybe more around feeling more comfortable in certain situations or coming out. So we need to support them wherever they are. Um, in terms of the family, we also have to do an assessment as well to see where they are. Uh, but some ideas I wanna provide um, 
are here. And the first one is to go to Family Acceptance Project. I have there the, the, the link where you can go. I have no conflict of, of interest related to that. I'm not part of this project, but I do know that this project is an organization that has worked on studying and developing guidelines to work with families of LGBTQ plus children. And according to them, family acceptance versus rejection is a mediator in mental health outcomes and suicidal behaviors, which is basically the same as support versus conflict in, in, in the model I work with, the social cognitive behavioral therapy model. Um, so they, they provide very specific guidelines and it's all based on study, on studies that they have done. Um, next, please. So working with the family, the first challenge with the families, particularly with caregivers, is to gain their trust. With Latinx families, if you don't have their trust, you have nothing. So you have to work around that since the very first time you meet with them. You must show respect for their values and belief, which is different than encouraging any idea about sexual orientation and gender. You respect, you listen, but you don't encourage encourage um, ideas that are against an LGBTQ affirmative approach. We stand for an LGBTQ plus affirmative approach, and at some point we will share our understanding of sexual orientation and gender, but we have to be understanding and respectful of their belief. We have to approach them in a non-judgmental way. Assume their concerns are based on love understand that it may be a process of grief for them because they may be losing their ideas and expectation for their child. Let them express free, freely their fears and concerns. And that's a way actually of gaining respect as a clinician. When that phase is um, already done, which will could be a constant in many ways, but at least when you have engaged and gained the respect of this family, you're ready to provide psychoeducation um, from general information that this is not an illness, uh, but a normal part of human diversity. And also besides giving general information about what is sexual orientation and gender identity and expression, you can also use and um, the family acceptance studies to explain how caregivers' behaviors, their words, their comments, their body language, their decisions relate to teens' well-being. And I have to say that they have a booklet in English and Spanish for parents, showing them in a very illustrative way statistics about how their teen may be affected if they uh, do and perform rejecting behaviors or comments. So that could be very powerful as well for them to see. Um, and, it's in a very, and it's a very simple language. And this is all, I mean, those booklets are free as well. Um, next, please. Another tool for psychoeducation is to show them other caregivers' journey. And I'm recommending this film, uh, Lead with Love. I like this film because I feel it's uh, very powerful because it is about real stories and the genuine process of these caregivers. It is a free film that you just have to Google it. And after watching the film, you could discuss the film with them. You can even do it in your own office or you can assign that as a, as a personal project for caregivers. And then you can ask, what did you think about the film? Where are you as parent in the process from surprise to acceptance? Could you relate to any of the family members? And then you can talk maybe because the family members they're presenting each have their own process. Um, so that's a way of listening, understanding, engaging, and also letting them bend their own concerns. Next, please. Um, Lead with Love um, is based on the stage models of change. Um, and it's a wonderful way to think about where the teen caregivers are in their process of acceptance. And there's also a paper 
uh, about that film that I suggest you also to look for. And it's very easy to find. So if the parents are, and you will do this question to yourself when you have a parents in front of you, if, the, if they are in the pre-contemplator phase, they are self-absorbed with their own grief, confusion, or concerns. Obviously, this is uh, assuming that they just they're just knowing about their kids' sexual identity or, or gender identity, okay? So in that, in, in that phase, as a therapist, you will have to provide a lot of understanding, listening, and support. If they are, caregivers are in the contemplator phase, they want to understand why, why this is happening to my son or my daughter or my teen. And this is the perfect timing for providing evidence-based information. If they are in the preparation and action stay phase, they are already over the other two and they want to know how they could support their child better. And that's the time to provide specific guidance and connect them to further resources and support groups. It's also important to know that accepting is a process and for some families, they will always be in an ongoing, this will be an ongoing process for them. Um, they also sustain uh, the people from Lead With Love that caregivers, I mean, I mean both, both group, like the Family Acceptance Projects and Lead With Love, and also myself, they uh, sustain that caregivers can learn to support their child, even if they don't agree with their sexual or, or gender identities by modifying or changing rejecting behaviors. And this is a key understanding um, for parents. Like even if they, their values, religious or, or just Latinx values, or for whatever reason, they stick to the idea that um, it's hard for them or that they can't or they don't accept their kids uh, orientation or, or gender identity, you can let them know that even if they don't agree, what important is their behaviors, their the way they act toward them. And that's why they have like they have a, a, an acronyms. Please next, I will show you what the acronyms are. Um, lead with love stand for um, let your affection show. So that means connect to to the, to your love, to your affection for your team. Express your pain away from your child, from your child, like, um, and, and do it, you know, caregiver with caregivers or someone else or a friend, but not in front of your, of your child. Avoid rejection, rejecting behaviors, and you can teach them what are those rejecting behavior, how those rejecting behavior look like, um, and do good before you feel good. Um, and they have a Spanish version for this. And Bo's short, quick guide could be um, found on the internet. When you Google Google it, the movie, and you see the film, you will see there um, these two uh, quick guidelines in Spanish and English that you can share with your your parents because this is again this is free. Um, next, so I present some ideas about how to work with LGBTQ plus teen and their families as we do in the social cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and I really encourage you to look for more, see the film, go to the acceptance project, read their materials, and also read the papers I'm suggesting. And, um, and at the end of this presentation, you will see two references of two workbooks that may be very helpful for you. And now I will briefly present some data from the pilot RCT, the randomized clinical trial uh, that was completed. And then we will go for questions and yeah, for question of the audience. So um, the main inclusion criteria for this pilot that was already completed was having active suicidal thoughts or having attempt suicide within the past two months. And most of the sample, as I said, was re uh, recruited from a psychiatric inpatient unit. Next. Next. Uh -huh. Yes, thank you. The primary aim of this pilot was um, assess feasibility, 
which means that we needed to know if the treatment protocol could be done, like the, the social cognitive behavioral therapy, and to see if a randomized clinical trial uh, was feasible to do with this population. And the secondary aim was to explore treatment effects on suicidation and attempt and psychiatric symptoms over time in comparison to treatment as usual. Next. We recruit 46 teens and at least one caregiver. And 22 were on the treatment as usual, 24 on the experimental. Next. In terms of generational status, half were second generation families. And that means that parents were born outside of US and teens were born in US. Approximately one quarter, 22% were first generation. First generation means both parents and teens born outside of the US. And third generation that were 26% is both parents and teens born in US. Next. As expected, most teens prefer to speak English and almost half of caregivers prefer Spanish. Next. The majority of adolescents identify themselves as females, followed by males with a 15% um, and by trans or gender fluid in an 11%. Next. Half report diverse sexual orientation and from those most identify as bisexual. Next. Primary results shows that the social cognitive behavioral therapy was feasible to implement and that doing an RCT with this population was feasible as well. And this was done in a real world setting with frontline therapies, um, mostly with master degree level. Next. In terms of our exploratory secondary aim, all outcome variables decrease significantly in both groups uh, over time. However, based on teens report, there were greater reductions at 12 months in the social cognitive behavioral therapy group on the present symptoms, internalized behaviors, and suicide attempts showing median, median effects for the social cognitive behavioral therapy. And you can see that those are the red numbers. Though the red numbers are the ones that are significant, and those numbers means that those are median effect size. Um, on the other hand, I also have to say that caregivers in the social cognitive behavioral therapy report more symptoms in their teens at six and 12 months than the caregivers in treatment as usual, which could seem contradictory. And, but one possible explanation that we, that we can think of is that maybe caregivers in the experimental condition are more prone to ask their teens about their symptoms or that parents are more aware of their kids' symptoms. Um, but again, there's reductions in, in both treatment options, but there are more significant in the experimental according to teens report. These results are exciting um, because it's, I know it's hard to find effects on a pilot, but it's still a pilot. And we need to assess treatment effect on a larger trial, and that's what is going on right now. We are um, doing this, uh, replicating this experiment in a larger trial, which is a full randomized clinical trial, and we expect to recruit 160 families. Next. Um, in conclusion, the social cognitive behavioral therapy for suicidal behaviors is the first outpatient treatment for suicidal behaviors among Latinx youth with positive results. And um, I still, there's a lot, a lot more that need to be done, but I feel that it's important to keep exploring treatment response based on sexual orientation and gender. Um, I think that for males, impulsive behavior and gender socialization, like not seeking help, may place them at higher risk of suicide. 
And for trans, non-binary, and non-conforming teens, clinical presentation and family environment are more challenging. So we still need to ask them more, maybe through case studies, qualitative interviews, how is treatment for them, and see how we can keep improving the treatment um, so they can um, receive a quality, quality care. So next, please. As I said, we're doing a, we are in a step four. We're doing that randomized clinical trial uh, to test efficacy and effectiveness. And this is supported by the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Um, and there's, there has been a long, a long journey of research since I started in Puerto Rico. Um, next. These are the two workbooks that I recommend that are uh, very helpful for um, LGBTQ plus teens. And, and there's one specific for gender, which is the second one. It is very practical and very helpful. Next, um, I just want to thank a lot of people. I mean, um, there's a lot of research assistant collaborators, mentors that have work on the development of this treatment and that has supported this research for, for a long time. And for more questions, that's my email and I am ResearchGate. Those that use ResearchGate, that's a nice um, platform where you can follow researchers and I have there um, a lot of papers around the this uh, approach, this treatment approach, case studies in English and in Spanish. So I encourage you um, to go there and read it if you if you feel that you want more information. I did not focus on suicidal behavior that much because it was more around tailoring treatment for um, sexual and gender diverse teens, but there's more information there on those papers. Um, and I also want to say that please follow the National Hispanic MH TTC on social media. Uh, this month is Pride Month, and they are putting out there some information to create awareness and and give evidence-based information relate, related to LGBTQ plus teens. And that's it. I will welcome any questions at this point. Thank you so much, Amanska. Uh, we have a couple of questions actually, but I, before I read the questions, I just wanted to um, give two reminders. The first, we have a chat, which is where everybody is writing their questions. Um, you should be able to see that I shared the link for the film and also a resource for parents related to the film. Um, I shared both links on that chat, as well as how to find the handout for today's presentation, because we've, um, we've gotten a couple of questions regarding that. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and then start with the questions for Jovanska. Oh, and I also wanted to <laughs> um, tell everybody that we usually have our presenters on webcam, but there's something mm -hmm. going on with the platform, and sadly today that was not possible. Um, so if you're used to um, being in our webinars and um, having uh, the presentation plus the presenter, we're deeply sorry for that. It's just that the platform is having issues. Okay, Jovanska, sorry for that. The first question. Mm -hmm. um, when the team answers the worksheet of gender, gender expression, and sexuality, what mm -hmm. would be a fun way to ask the question on the worksheet, or would we just give the worksheet to the team to fill out and then talk through the worksheet with the team? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so there's no, um, how would say, no standard way of doing this. I have done both. I have worked with them with the worksheet you know, at the same time, I just go over it with them and sometimes they just want to fill it out and then we discuss. Um, the idea is just to do, to do uh, an open discussion, like 
fluid, open, uh, nice discussions about these topics. And I actually framed that as, um, you know, you are a teen, you are in a phase that some people call or psychologists call like identity uh, crisis where you get to know more about yourself and you get to understand better yourself. So I would like to know how are you seeing so yourself so far? And there's a lot of aspects that have to do with your identity. So let's look them, you know, let, let's look at that. And then we go over all of those aspects. And um, that's how we do it. Um, but there's, you can be very creative. I mean, I, I, if there are teams that are more creative and they use, they want to use art, that that's perfectly fine as well. Um, but I will always try to get, you know, to, to have some answers on those questions. Thank you, Yavanska. Oh, uh, I think this one's related to that, I'm not sure. It says, is it require special training in order to deliver the who am I, who I am, sorry, questionnaire presented in the slides? Um, that who am I worksheet is part of my treatment manual. I have to say that we have a therapist treatment manual in English and Spanish. We have a, a caregiver manual, a teens manual. So that that worksheet is in the the the, the teens manual. Um, I'm not ready to share that with the world yet, but when I'm in training, I try to share what is going on so far and the idea so people could do their own. Let, let's say use their own uh, who am I kind of uh, paper that you can build. Um, but there's there's not a particular training to discuss identity. Um, there is training to do the social cognitive behavioral therapy overall, uh, but that's that's kind of a different story. Uh, but, but for discussion of identity, you just have to um, do it, uh, understanding all the things that we have discussed here. But I do feel it is important, that's the part I want to share, that identity is a key component on treatment for Latinx youth with suicidal behaviors and particularly um, with kids with uh, diverse sexual uh, orientation and, and gender identities, but to any, not just for them, but to any teen. This is a central, a central issue that is easier if you bring that since the very beginning and it open up for a lot of exploration in, and see how that ha is related to their suicidality. And if it's, it may not, but there's, you know, different ways of, of seeing that, but definitely for, for that session, I don't think you need any particular training. But knowing what we have discussed, like knowing knowing that how is identity, how identity evolves for LGBTQ teens and how identity evolves for other teens in general. You, of course, you need to have that knowledge, that background, um, which is a, basically a developmental perspective as well, an LGBTQ affirmative approach. Thank you, Avanska, for the answering that question because I saw another one regarding the general topic. It says how providers could be trained in this model. I don't know if they're talking about um, the specific model that you were um, explaining for treatment. I, I guess it's the, yeah, the social cognitive behavior therapy. Um, so we, I mean, Randomized uh, clinical trial is in is in in way right now is in place. Um, I have done like trainings before, um, but is is um, I don't know how to how to respond to that. Um, um, there there's no platform right now where I can tell you that you can be trained in in the social cognitive behavioral therapy model. Um, but you can read the papers and know what is important so far. Um, I'm happy to provide training. Uh, uh, you know, I have, I, I know I have done in the University of Puerto Rico, I have done professional training of one full day, for example, but that's um, something that, that we will have to discuss and negotiate. But 
um, I mean, my the, the the clinicians I have, for example, just to give you an example of the kind of type of training they need, um, the basic training is is 12 hours uh, in like face to face, or face to face, or 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 through a webinar, like because I have done it also like this, like 12 hours in readings different readings, discussions, and I usually um, see one of their case, like um, I supervise one case, I, I listen to every session and I provide feedback. Um, and I obviously they follow the treatment manuals in, and we get into supervision, weekly supervision. That's the way I have trained the clinicians that have worked with me for, this, for these studies. Um, I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, I think it was pretty much right there. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, so you talk about a bootlet before and they're asking where they can um, get access to it. To I what? Have... Sorry, Isa, to what? To a booklet. Oh, the booklet, yes. Yeah. So the Family Acceptance Project is one. If you go to their website that I put on, on those slides, you will have access to a manual. Actually, there's a manual that SAMHSA uh, supported, and they have those booklets in Spanish and English. You just go to the website and you will be able to find it. With Film uh, Lead with Love, also if you Google it, um, you will see on their web on their website the uh, those quick... Uh, guidelines that they have and it, you just have to download it and print it and they have you know uh it, it's free they have their copyright but it's for that is is to 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 use it in your in your sessions so if you get when you get the handouts of this presentation you will just have to uh go to their website lead with love if you put this with lead with love film you will find it immediately and if you put family assistant pro family assistant project you will get into their website as well and you will be able to get um their materials and information they actually family assistant project also have some other uh video clips like movies films that they work um there's one coming in spanish and english but it seems that it's not yet there i'm i will Get it as soon as arrives. You will have to pay some money for that, but that's another a great tool to to work with your your parents in in sessions. Awesome. And I just wanted to um, make sure everybody remembers. We actually posted the link on the chat, so that's a good start um, for the Lead with Love film. Besides the other links that you. Um, already provided as well on the handout. Mm, so our next our next question says, what to do when caregivers are stuck as an obstacle towards the teen's treatment? What to do when parents are stuck? Um, and that I yeah, and that doesn't lead to move along the treatment with the teens. Um, you know, there, there are different ways of answering that. Um, if, if the parents are stuck, and, but they are bringing the teen to the sessions, um, then at least you have, you have uh, a good amount of things that you can do. Um, because there's a lot you can do individually with the teen, and part of that would be to help them understand the things that they can control and the things that they cannot control and some of those things that they cannot control is how their parents will react to certain things if they will accept or no or the degree let's say the degree of acceptance they will have toward their sexual identity and gender identity um, but you can keep working with a teen to strengthen in them, like like empower them I would say empower them uh, and help them get a, a, a as much as possible, a nice identity integration, um, as much as possible. And of course, as well, trying to connect the teen with other resources. Um, for example, there are schools that have uh, uh, support groups. Um, there are 
pride youth groups in different towns. There is internet, which there's also there are some connections um, in the internet to support groups, evidence-based information. Uh, there's the Trevor Project for kids that have suicidal behavior that are part of the LGBTQ community. Um, so you need to know all those so you can help the teen connect physically or through a network, even a, a, a you know, like a, um, a well, I'm with COVID-19, it may be more uh, through, through social media, but connect in somewhere, in some way with organizations that support them. Um, so is the, is the the parent is there a stock i mean you can just work with them at their own pace so it's a it's a dance i would say between um connecting and challenge connecting and challenge you know you you have to listen understand and support them but also try to give them a little bit of challenge um and, and again, if there are talk on, on on their own values because of many reasons, right? Um, that they, they feel this is not right. This is not right for their teen. You can at least try to get them to the point of saying, okay, this may not be right for you. I understand you come from a different place, a different values, a different perspective, but at least because you love your teen and the evidence says that um, that rejection is related to suicide attempt and to mental health issues, at least you could um, express your affection. I mean, is your affection depending on their sexual orientation and gender identity, or you still love your, your son or daughter or teen above that, right? So you have to appeal to their love and see how their behavior. So, you know, think what you want to think but at least your behavior, um, you can show them with your behavior, your love. And that's what the lead with love is trying to basically promote. And also the Septem Project that, that have, the Septem Project have done a lot of work, Family Septem Project, a lot of work with families. Um, if they leave treatment, then that's, that's a harder situation. Um, because if, if you cannot work, at least with the teen, there's not that much that you can do. Thank you, Bavisca, for that answer. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on with my audio. Someone told me that um, you cannot listen me well uh, to me well enough, so I'm trying to raise my voice here for the mm -hmm. next question. Um, it says, would you have any specific recommendations for supporting older teens and young adults using this model who have been kicked out of their homes after coming out? Hmm. Um, using this model, meaning this approach, the such a cognitive behavior therapy approach. Um, so if they have been kicked out of their house, um, Again, if we if we see the ecological model and the family is not accepting and, and there's no way they could be, then we have to build families. You know, and, and again, even if the biological family is there, I think very important part of identity integration is building family. And family means the family that is non-biological, it's the chosen family, right? So that's why it is so important to get support from other peers and organizations that work with the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and that's also a very important concept that, that we need to teach those young adults and, and teens that there is a chosen family. It's not, family is not only the one that is is biological you know there's people that could become really um caring and powerful and long-lasting relationship in your life that you choose them um and i think that would be the other way to go in terms that i mean it's important and we want the caregivers to support them and we will help them as much as possible 
but if that's not possible, and even if it's possible, you want to expand that connections for that teen. Um, I have to say, I haven't worked with homeless teens. I know that's a very uh, different work, and I respect that. Um, and it's, 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 it may be uh, uh, like a different, it, it may need a different way of tailoring treatment for homeless teens, um, more and beyond what I have discussed here. But I, I think that that feeling or sense of community besides the biological family is very, very important for the LGBTQ community. Thank you, Yovanska. And I also wanted to say we shared, I believe it was yesterday on our social media, uh, a case study of a teen who was kicked out of his house. And it's basically a story of resiliency and how he was able to basically um, uh, do whatever he wanted in terms of finishing high school, getting a job and all that. So it's a great story. Um, to see it from the perspective uh, of things that thrive, even though um, they go through all these circumstances. So mm -hmm. that's another one to, to watch as well. Um, another, Isa saying that is, is another, I mean, we, we didn't have that much time, but it's very important also to uh, um, underscore resiliency and that, that other side, like all those, positive aspect and the resiliency that teens have to deal with all this, you know, difficult circumstance. And that's why also identity is important, like to see it in different ways and, and what all those great characteristics that you have that are helping you move along, you know, and, and yeah, just want to say that as well. Yeah, thank you, Jemanska. And I also wanted to um, tell everyone if there are um, Spanish speaking um, persons in the audience, we're also repeating our first um, webinar that it was called um, Barriers. Oh, I'm forgetting that name. Uh, uh, Barriers in Mental Health Services for Trans, Queer, and Non Binary Latinx Community. We're actually doing it. Uh, the 29th of this month in Spanish. So uh, if anyone here speaks Spanish and wasn't able to um, see the first uh, webinar, uh, you can definitely go to our website and sign up for that one that's coming up um, in the next weeks. Uh, I think we have time for two more questions. So I'm gonna go right ahead and ask the next one. Uh, so, and, um, so we just don't get past too much um, in terms of time. Uh, okay, so next one says, are there any resources for discussing hormone replacement therapy with parents and where to find information for clients who voice interest in engaging in hormonal therapy? Hmm, that's a very good one. You know, I, I can, I would be able to respond that if you were living in Rhode Island, I know where you can get that in Rhode Island and what are the pediatricians that I refer uh, it, my teens to that are very LGBTQ affirmative and that they will be able to explain that better to them. I don't know about other places like Puerto Rico or, or any other, you know, estate. Um, so that's challenging. I, I don't, I, I have to really say I don't know, but I could we can search and maybe we can send that along um, to see where, if there's any, any um, what I would say, any website or any uh, general information that, that you can have related to that. Because yes, I do believe it's important from the clinical perspective to know about the hormone treatments that are there and how they work and also refer them to people you trust that could explain that from a medical standpoint and that that are good working with teens. Um, so we can follow up on that, Anissa, I guess that we can, you can post that later on somewhere. Yeah, that would be awesome. Uh, okay, we have so many good questions. Trying to see, um, 
But also, but let me tell you, in terms of the manual, the second manual uh, that I that I recommend, um, the one that is called the Gender Quest Workbook, they do talk about about that. You will have to buy the the, the workbook. Of course, but but they touch base with that in terms of how to explain that to to your trans teens and parents. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Don't worry, don't worry. Okay, so our next one says: When teens answer if they are satisfied with their own sexual orientation, besides depending on the apps acceptance of the people around the teens could it also depend on the teens self-esteem of their own sexuality and if you um, want to do that, i'll do it again yeah, go ahead go ahead <laughs> <laughs> okay it says when teens answer i guess oh. in the questionnaire you discussed before uh -huh. if they are satisfied with their own sexual orientation uh -huh. Besides, depending on the acceptance of the people around the teens, could it also depend on the teen's self-esteem of their own sexuality? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I kind of get it, yes. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, their, their satisfaction about their sexual orientation could do or be influenced by many different things. One of that could be surra be surrounded by accepting people, it could have to do with self-esteem, but remember the point I think I want to underscore here is that um, self-esteem will have to do um, or could have to do with internalized homophobia or before we are transphobia, right? If it's in terms of sexual orientation, if the teen is having a growing identity or is questioning, is you know, is in the process of coming into self. Um, you know, the message that we receive out there is not, yeah, great, you're gay or lesbian. No, it's a, it's a negative message that people are constantly receiving against any other sexual orientation besides being a heterosexual. So that will definitely impact how you will see your sexuality if you are feeling attracted to someone of your same sex, right? So that's what I want to underscore. So it's hard to basically to separate those aspects. How is your self-esteem, you know? But also, of course, you having a poor self-esteem will affect everything, your identity overall, but that self-esteem could be influenced by the message that you're hearing about sexuality. And then you starting being aware that, oh, my sexuality is not, it's not the normative. And I put in the normative in quotes, right? It's not the normative. I kind of feel like I'm not heterosexual and that's what is expected, right? As, as, as an, a heteronormative value. But yes, sexuality in terms, if you see sexuality overall, like how we relate to someone I attracted to, if we see in more in a more ample way, is um, how do I, I interact with someone, yes, that I like, there's the, all those are aspects of sexuality, and it may be also affected with your self-esteem that is not necessarily related to sexual orientation, but it's, it's so tied that it's very hard to separate. Isa, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much for all the information, and this was an amazing webinar and you provide a lot of resources for our providers. I know they really appreciate appreciate it. So thank you very much for your time for taking this um, also this time um, to answer our participant questions because I know there's a lot of questions. Thank you. Thank you very much to everyone that was here today. Um, and I hope you stay with us for our next webinar. Follow us on our social media and please provide, um, answer our survey. Thank you very much, Dr. Jovanska. Thank you all of you for your attention. And I hope everyone have a great day. And happy Pride for everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye.